you know? I like, I love the good music. I just love the good music. And so we've been blessed today, but Williams, he's one of my special guys too. And uh, good music, good, good music. My wife isn't here today. I, I don't know if she's watching us online, but uh, you know, she's been suffering with a strange, uh, some, something's wrong with her left knee. And uh, so she's always hoping that the knee does not act up. Uh, but the knee did act up yesterday. And so she cannot bend that left knee today. I promised her that I would come home early. So uh, after we end today, the divine worship, I, I'm going to keep my promise and I'm going to go home early today. I think we do expect uh, the weather to deteriorate anyway, so maybe many of you may want to be on your way earlier than you typically would anyways. So uh, for those of you who uh, do expect my Bible class, I'm going to wave the Bible class this afternoon. I'm going to go home to mama today, today, and have a restful afternoon. I do have a few calls I want to make as well. I'll get the opportunity to, to catch up with some work that uh, I've fallen behind on, like Sister Burton, who I, uh, has anyone had word on Sister Burton's case? I know Sister Burton got sick as we were leaving, Sister Burton's mom. This is Burton's, <laughs> the youth leader's grandmother. That's the one I'm referring to. But I think she's in hospital, and I think she is either due for an operation or may have had or is having an operation, things like that. Uh, so uh, I'll get the opportunity to catch up on a few of those things uh, later this evening. Uh, today, I want to share with you a little bit. It's a little bit of what I didn't do on Wednesday night. I, we had a wonderful time on Wednesday night. There was a beautiful congregation here for the funeral service. I, I looked out, and, uh, and when I saw the audience, I thought, wow, I need to probably just talk to these people. And, um, and so I did. So I had uh, some notes in my sermon, and so I, uh, maybe God wanted you to get most of that message, so I'm gonna save that for today, and, uh, and that's what I did. Uh, so I'm gonna share with you again today on the theme that I, I've shared with you on this theme recently, uh, but there's a special bit of message I want to deliver today, and I could do it in one sentence, but I'm going to preach the entire sermon before I do that, and then I'll send you on your way. Before I get into the message, however, we are still here in the month of February. We want to keep reminding you to be thankful uh, for the privileges that we enjoy here in this land of ours. Uh, particularly, I think we need to be thankful still for the privilege of worship. We still do have the opportunity to worship freely, without fear. And so we need to be thankful to those who have paved the way. A lot of the freedoms we enjoy currently is, particularly as a minority group in this nation of ours, uh, the road was paved uh, by some who went before us. And we have to remember these things, and uh, particularly passed on to our children uh, information about the heritage. And the freedoms we enjoy today must not be taken for granted. We must remember those. I want us to sing again a little bit of the national anthem, the black national anthem. Uh, 
if you can put some of that up on the screen, Brother Lizelle will get the music cranked up, and uh, we are going to stand and sing that together today as we work our way through. And I think that there are some folk who are planning uh, for the very last Sabbath of the month, and uh, they're planning a special event for that day. We look forward to that as well as we work our way. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Uh, we just stand together as soon as uh, you have gotten that up there. Do you have it? Uh, if not, I think we may be able to at least do the first verse even without the words. Here we go. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies of liberty Let our rejoicing rise High as the listening skies let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the rising sun of a new day begun let us march on till victory is won gracious heavenly father again we thank you for your word we thank you for Jesus we thank you for the assurance of salvation we thank you God that Jesus has promised to come again to receive us now as we open your word and as we look in again today we pray God that you will motivate us through your word to be or to remain committed to you until Jesus comes. Thank you for blessing us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, praise team. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Verses 1 to 3. The Bible records what I believe is a passage that even the unchurched knows. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. 
What a wonderful promise in God's word. Jesus is coming again. The words from his very lips. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again. To take you where I am. You know, when Adam and Eve sinned, the Garden of Eden, God had options. He had options. He could have, he could have just allowed Adam and Eve to die and get him a new pair. That was an option. He could have done it. He was God. He could have gotten him a new pair and start this thing all over again. But even right there in the very presence of sin, Adam and Eve, after they sinned, God came looking for them in the garden. They were hiding. The Bible says they sold fig uh, leaves, fig leaves, made aprons, covered themselves when they discovered that they were naked. And they went hiding. But God found them and uh, had a conversation with Adam and Eve. Even our first parents received the promise. For in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, when God spoke to Adam and Eve and he said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He, sh he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. God was promising to Adam and Eve an option that they would be given an opportunity. A fresh new start. Uh, he promised that he would come and he would deal with Satan and with sin. And so during the years that followed all the believers who lived thereafter, they lived in anticipation of the coming of Jesus to die on a cross to pay the penalty for that sin. It was the promise of the Messiah. Enoch, seven generations after Adam and Eve, still kept the promise alive. Jude chapter 14 and verse 15, Enoch, Enoch, the, sec, the seventh generation from Adam prophesied saying, See, the Lord is coming with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict everyone of all the deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. See! The Lord is coming. Enoch was looking for the coming of Jesus. The theme of the patriarchs and the prophets all center on the coming of the Redeemer. We think of Job, for example. Even in an hour of great sorrow and of great pain, Job pinned his hope on the return of of Jesus. And so in Job chapter 19, as Job was stricken, stricken by the devil, Job was heard to say, I know that my Redeemer lives and that he will stand upon the earth. Job was looking for the second coming of Christ. And although his body was pained with boils and his frame was broken and bruised. Job was heard to say, 
after my skin has been thus destroyed, then in my flesh shall I see God. Job was looking for the second coming. David was looking for the second coming. The psalmist emphasized the importance of the coming of the Lord. That's why in Psalm 50 we hear the psalmist say, Our God shall come and shall not keep silent. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth. He will say, Gather my saints together to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. God is coming. Job believed it. Enoch believed it. David wrote about it. The angels who came down that honorable day that Jesus was going to heaven. As he stood on the mountain with those disciples and, and as they saw him ascend and disappear into the cloud. The angel came down to reassure the disciples. My friend, the disciples expected Jesus to come again. Yes, in Acts chapter 1, verses 10 through 11, the angels were heard to say to the disciples, as they were looking up into heaven, as Jesus disappeared, the angels were heard to say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? Why do you stand gazing up into heaven? For this same Jesus. Now, not another one. Not an imposter. Uh, there will be imposters. But this same Jesus. The same one who walked with them. The same one who went to that wedding and performed that miracle that day. This same Jesus. The same one who raised Lazarus from the dead. This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. My friends, Peter and Paul Mark and Luke, they all lived with the anticipation of the second coming of Jesus. Paul called it the blessed hope. And I don't know whenever somebody dies, I don't know that there's anything on earth that could really assure you, that can really buoy your spirits up when you are steep in grief. I don't know of anything that can really build you up and lift you up as that blessed hope. The hope that one day Jesus is going to come again and Jesus will bring to life all of the sleeping saints. Those sleeping saints, my friends, it's referred to as the blessed hope. Do not marvel at this, says John in chapter 5. Do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. All who are in the grave will hear his voice. His voice. Now remember, Jesus was the active agent at creation. You wonder how Jesus is going to do this. But when a person dies and they're placed in the grave, and over time, that body deteriorates and becomes dust. Jesus, one day, is going to call from heaven with a shout. And all that are in the grave. Now, I don't know. I don't know. The Bible says all that are in the grave will hear his voice. Not only will they hear, but the book says they will come forth. They will come forth. But, but watch this. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. The good and the evil. 
Every man is going to hear his voice one of these days. You know, the Bible records the events as they would unfold. The first thing that will happen as the heavens open and as Jesus sends from heaven a loud shout, uh, the first thing that is going to happen is that there's going to be a resurrection of the dead in Christ. Those who died. Imagine everyone who has ever died believing in the promise all through the ages from Adam to Enoch to Job to David to your mama and your papa. Huh? Everyone who died believing in Jesus Christ will come forth will come up out of the grave. It will be a time, my friends, when the dead in Christ shall come forth out of the grave. For First Thessalonians teach us in verse, uh, chapter 4 and verse 16 that the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. And then the book says the dead in Christ will rise will rise. First thing, the dead are raised. Then it will also be a time when the Lord will bestow immortality upon the saints. He will bestow immortality upon the saints. You know, this morning I was talking to the family and to us here, the baby dedication, and I was telling you that listen we have to be so careful about training our children when they are young i was a little little boy i don't even remember how old i was but i remember this we were living there my family in a little village where there was a catholic school and all the children went to that little catholic school and as part of the program there at the school, we would receive religious education. And, uh, and they would teach us uh, what was called uh, at the time, I don't know if they still call it, the catechism. Yeah. And, and, and the teacher would, would teach us line by line. And, uh, and she would ask a question. And the children would answer. In unison, we were taught to answer. And so on that very day, uh, the priest came to visit. And the teacher was putting us on display. And so she was going uh, question after question after question. And then she came to this question that asked, on the immortality of the soul. And the children all in unison answered, when I say my soul is immortal, I mean my soul can never die. I remember this from, uh, I, don't, I don't even know how old, maybe I was five, six, but I was taught that. But you know, we now live in bodies that are subject, our bodies subject to death. We, we die. And that is as a consequence of sin. For Grandma God told Adam and Eve, the day that thou eat, you eat from that tree, you will die. Devil said, no, you will not surely die. And so through the ages, there, there are those who continue to believe that there is a part of you that cannot die. But when you die, I was telling the funeral on Wednesday, when you die, you are dead. All of you die. 
There is no part of you that remain alive. There is nothing that we, we can do for you. I was telling them on Wednesday night, there's nothing we can do for you after you die. The whole of you die. And you will remain dead until God says something about it. But oh my friends, when God steps out and Jesus gathers the heavenly host and he steps out of heaven uh, to put an end to sin uh, and, and to call his children from their graves, the Bible says that it will be a time when he will bestow immortality. We are going to be changed. Right now we are mortal. We are subject to death. But again in 1 Corinthians we read this passage that assures us, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye when at the last trump not before at the last trump and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed what change is going to take place we are going to cha be changed from mortal to immortal these mortal bodies are going to be uh, are going to be done away with forever and he's going to give us bodies like he gave Adam and Eve before they sinned we are going to be given immortal bodies can you think about that for a while could you think about having a body that does not feel pain a body that does not get sick could you think of 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 a body having a body that that just is just well a body that does not go bald did he say go bald he said go old. oh he said go old <laughs> could you think about it I mean, we cannot even think about what that feels like, what that would be like, because our minds are so finite. But could you think about it? Man, what a day that's going to be when God is going to give us immortal bodies. We'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Let me finish the text. What the text says, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible incorruptible we shall be changed so it will be a time when we'll be given immortal bodies immortal bodies it is a time when saved families will be reuni reunited it's going to be a time when saved families will be reunited you know, have you ever lost a loved one? Hmm? You know, you, you know, uh, you don't ever get used to it. You don't ever get used to it. And uh, there are good days, and there are some days when you just remember it all. You just remember it all. And I remember I was, uh, I was driving down the street one day. My dad had passed, and he was buried long time I'm driving down the street and and the entire experience came back to me the entire experience of the funeral and everything and so came back to me and I was I was driving there at I, I was at a red light stopped at a red light and as I, I I felt like I was taken up out of this world into the very experience of the whole funeral and everything again and as I was sitting there, as fate would have it, a hearse came driving 
by right before me you know you stop at a red light and the cross street there uh, the traffic is moving and you are waiting for the traffic the hearse came driving right by and I sat there and as I saw the hearse going by uh, that, that, uh, there was a feeling of grief just overtook me and I just sat there frozen in my seat until the the horns began to honk my friends there's coming a day when all of our loved ones who died believing in Jesus looking for his coming there's coming a day when they will be united with us so in Jeremiah chapter 31 I find comfort in this passage thus said the Lord a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. Thus said the Lord, refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. For your work shall be rewarded, said the Lord. Your work shall be rewarded. So it's the time when families who have been broken will be brought back together again it's going to be a time when the wheat will be separated from the tears it'll be a time when the wheat will be separated from the tears you know we do a good job of it now uh, we've learned over time how to fool the people how to look the part Hmm? how to look the part how to play the game but there's coming a time when the wheat will be separated from the tears yes indeed Matthew chapter 13 records what will happen he who sows the good seed is the son of man says the text the field is the world and the good seed are the sons of the kingdom but the tears the sons of the wicked one the enemy who sows them is the devil the harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are the angels therefore are the tears as the tears are gathered and burnt in the fire so it will be at the end of the age the son of man will send out his angels and they will gather out of the, his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness uh, will be cast into the furnace of fire. There will be a wailing and a gnashing of teeth. There will be a wailing and a gnashing of teeth. You know, one of my favorite preachers as a young man growing up in the church used to say, at this point he would say, those who have no teeth will have to gum it but then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father he who has ears to hear let him hear you see there's uh, there's some exciting things ahead of us there are some fabulous days to look forward to but everybody who's talking about heaven ain't going there. Not everybody that shows up at church is packed and ready to go. There are those who look like they're going somewhere who are not going to go anywhere because the Bible has already told us that there's going to be a time when the wheat and the tears will be separated. It will also be a time, my friends, it will be a time when no one will be able to say, save me. There won't be any conversions at that time. If you have to be converted, you would have to do it now. You'll have to do it now. So Luke chapter 13 warns us 
But when the master of the house had risen up and shut the door, you will be standing on the outside, knocking. And the Lord of the house will answer and say to you, I do not know you. That is serious. That is serious. Because when you look at this passage, uh, you get a sense that this uh, Luke was not talking to the unchurched. He was talking to the brethren. Because they are the ones who expected to be in. But there is coming a day when there's going to be a great disappointment. Uh, yes, my friends, the master of the house will shut the door. And some are going to be on the outside. And when the master answers to the knock and the knocking, the master will say, I never knew you. Now, 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 depending on which version you read, there are different renderings of this text. But the one that frightens me most is the one that reads, I never knew you. It's not just, I don't know you now. I didn't know you last week. I never knew you. That one is scary. It means that we, we, can, we can go to church, Sabbath after Sabbath. We can do all that we do here, and the master don't know us. So that's a serious thought. What then should be our attitude? What then should be our attitude with regard to the second coming? Knowing all this that we now know, what should be our attitude? You know, the Bible describes in a few places that those who are considered the saints, the saved, the saints would be looking with great anticipation for the coming. They would be praying. You know Revelation chapter 22? John there in vision. When you read Revelation 22, there are three or four times in that chapter, John says and writes the words of Jesus, where Jesus promised that he would come. Surely he said, I come quickly. I come quickly. And when John writes in verse 20 of Revelation 22, the words of Jesus, where Jesus says, Surely I am coming quickly. John, in response, shouts, Amen! Amen! Even so, come, Lord Jesus. You know, you know, church, you know one of the things that concern me, and I think it concerns me personally, is, is that is that I am not I am not as excited as I ought to be about the second coming. You know, we go about life and we go about things, we even go about church. But we need to be excited about the second coming. We need to be excited about that. They will say. We have waited for him. Isaiah chapter 25. We have waited. And in that day it will be said. In that day it will be said. Behold this is our God. We have waited for him. And he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice. In his salvation. The saints will actually be looking for his appearing. Looking for his appearing. Hebrews 9 and 28 says, those who eagerly wait for him, he's going to appear. To those who eagerly are waiting for him, he will appear. Now, 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 so the saints are looking. The saints are anticipating. The saints are in great expectation. The world around, the world around, the world at large 
You're not looking, not anticipating, just business as usual. Matthew 24 says that the world will be occupied with the sinful pleasures, just as they used to be, just as it was in Noah's day. Verse 37 says, but as in the day of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be, for as in the days before the flood, they, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. One of the things that we have to be so careful about is that church does not become such a happy place that we become so comfortable here. That the most important things that we do will we'll be having lunch and dinners. Matthew 24 says in that day there would even be Christians who would be indifferent to the coming. Yes, it's in there. Matthew chapter 24 verse 48 and onward. If that evil servant says in his heart, my master delay, is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servant and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking. Yeah? That is talking specifically about the church. You're still in church. But you think, it's not going to happen yet. I can play around a little bit. I can hang out a little bit. And I have time. I have time. You read the text. If, verse 48, if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat his fellow servant and to eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him. And at an hour that he is not aware of. And watch what verse 51 says. Verse 51 says, and will cut him in two. And appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. Then we find those famed words again. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What that means, my friends, is that a lot of Christians who go to church are going to end up in that day lost. That's what that means. Then some will actually scoff, says Second Peter. Scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust. To all these, the Lord will come suddenly, when they do not think that he will come. So in 1 Thessalonians 5, the Bible records... Concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. If I may paraphrase this, concerning the times and the seasons, my brothers of East New York, I should not be preaching this sermon to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so come as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, the brethren of East New York, you are not in darkness that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Let us watch 
and be sober. You know, in that day, the wicked are going to be running to the rocks and to the mountains, fall on us, fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. I, I, I told you that I could have preached my sermon in one sentence. I think I'm almost to the sentence. Because what I really want to say to you today, my friends, is this. Is this. You and I need to be ready. You and I need to be ready. There was a king in the Old Testament story is recorded there in Isaiah chapter 38, King Hezekiah. The book says that Hezekiah was sick unto death. Sick unto death. The prophet Isaiah came to Hezekiah with a message that I want to leave with you today. The message was short. I told you it's just a sentence. Maybe we can settle for just a little part of the sentence. But when Isaiah came to Hezekiah, Uh, Amos came to Hezekiah. He brought this message to him. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Here it comes. Set thine house in order. Set thine house in in order. If you don't, you will die. Set your house in order. Be ye therefore ready. Be ye Therefore, ready. For in such an hour as he think not, the Son of Man cometh. You know what a day it's going to be when he comes? It's going to be a glorious day. It's going to be a glorious day. I'll be there. I'll be there. And if I don't see you there, trust me, I'm not going to miss you. Every single person has an opportunity, the very same opportunity. If you do not make full use of it, God help you. But my message to you this morning, set your house in order for in such an hour as he think not the son of man cometh now is he coming yes he is set your house in order turn to your neighbor and say neighbor 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 Wake him up. Neighbor's still sleeping. Wake him up. Say, neighbor. Neighbor. The preacher says, set your house in order. Hey, hey, turn to the other neighbor. Say, other neighbor. Jesus is coming. You need to set your house. That means make things right. Make things right. Live right. Be right. Stay right. For in such an hour as you think not, the 
Son of Man, Jesus, is coming. God bless you. I pray that all of us will be over on the other side. That's my prayer for the entire family today. That every single last one of you make it over there. And then we go hang out in heaven. What a glorious day that's going to be. God bless you real good. Real, real good. That's my prayer for you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.